All right, welcome to your stats notes video. <clears throat> this is the day where we're going to see how the calculator actually comes up with its regression equation and where those numbers are coming from. All right, and with that, we're actually going to start using the more proper name for it, which is the least squares regression line. Um, and we're going to talk about what this least squares is actually referring to. Um, but before we can do that, we have to talk a little bit about residuals. Now, residuals were mentioned um, last class, and we said that it was actual minus predicted. But we're just going to go a little deeper into it today um, so that we can talk about where the regression line is actually coming from. All right, so over here on the right, we have a scatter plot that shows hikers, weights, and backpack weights. So we actually looked at this at the beginning of the unit. All right, so in the regression equation, what does the X represent? So here's our regression equation, or our least squares regression line. The X is the actual body weight. What does y hat represent, right? Because it's y hat, that is the predicted pack weight. All right. So what we have here is we have our regression line. And then we have the actual data that led to the creation of that line. And then these little vertical lines are just showing how far off we were um, from each point. So there's your data point. This is the vertical distance down to the line. And then this line represents our predictions. Because remember, the regression line is giving you predictions, but it's not, it's unlikely to ever be 100% accurate, right? Usually the predictions are going to be a little bit off, right? And these vertical lines are just showing us how far off they truly are, all right? And the size of those vertical lines is what we generally refer to as the residuals. So the residual is the difference between an observed value All right, which are the points in your scatter plot. So the difference between an observed value of the response variable and the values predicted by the regression line. All right. So you can think of this as the residual equals observed y minus predicted y. Or you could just write that as y minus y hat, all right? Because y hat is the predicted, y is the observed, all right? So actual or observed minus predicted, all right? Now, one thing that I want to state here is when you have a negative residual, all right, what does that imply? All right, so a negative residual is when the points are below the prediction line. All right, so anything below the line is a negative residual. Anything above the line is a positive residual. 
all right? Which kind of makes sense, all right? If it's above the line, it's a positive residual. If it's below the line, it's a negative residual, all right? The part that sometimes gets confusing is a negative residual means the point is below the line, but that actually means that your guess, which is the line, is too high, all right? So a lot of times you hear negative residual and you think, oh, that must mean my guess was too low. Actually, a negative residual is below the line. And since the line is your guess, that means your guess was too high because it's above the point. And then on the other flip side of that, a positive residual implies that your guess was too low. Again, positive residuals are above the line. If the line is your guesses, that means your guess was below the actual value. Um, so you end up with a positive residual there. All right, so be careful about questions that ask guess too high, guess too low, because I think the result is a little non-intuitive. Like if I say here, like, do you think points above the line are positive or negative? You're probably going to say positive. If I say, do you think points below the line are positive or negative, you're going to say negative. This part is intuitive, but when you frame it in terms of guessing too high or too low, I think it's the opposite of what most people expect. All right. So when a guess is too high, it's a negative residual. When a guess was too low, it's a positive residual. Now, what are the steps for finding a residual? All right. Um, for a given x, find the predicted value of the response variable, which basically means plug it into the equation. Subtract the actual value minus the predicted value. All right, so pretty simple. All right. So example one says, from the hiker data above, find the residual for a hiker who weighs 187 pounds. All right. So 187 pounds means that we're probably referring to this guy right here. All right, and if we go over horizontally, we could say that the actual value for this person is probably about 29-ish, all right? And this is coming from the graph. That's where I'm getting that data, from, that number from. And then the predicted value is where we start using our regression equation. So we would say, all right, 16.3 plus 0 0.0908 times the 187. And let's see, what does that give us? All right, 16.3 plus 0 0.0908 times 187 gives us 33.28, 33.28. So what is our residual? All right, the residual is the observed or the actual minus predicted. So 29 minus 33.28, or put another way, negative 4.28. Okay, so that would be our residual in this situation. All right, example two. From the hiker data above, find the residual for a hiker who weighs 116 pounds. Okay, so again, 116 pounds. We would say, all right, 116, that's probably, if that's 110, that must be this person right here. So we would say the actual for that person is 28. And again, that's coming from the graph. Um, the predicted would be our 16.3 plus 0 0.0908, 0 0.0908 times the 116. And again, at that point, it's just calculator work. So 
plus 0 0.0908 times 116, 26.83, which then means your residual, again, is the actual minus the predicted. So for us, that's 28 minus 26.83. Or put another way, it's a positive 1.17. All right, so one last one here. For the hiker data above, find the residual for a hiker who weighs 170 pounds. And I know what you're thinking, like, Mr. Vona, this isn't that hard. Why are we doing it three separate times? Um, we need it for what we're going to talk about in a second. So that's what we're doing here. All right. Uh, find the residual for a hiker who weighs 170 pounds. All right, so 170 pounds is probably this data point right here. So if we go over, um, let's just say that's about 35. So we're going to say the actual for this one is 35. Again, that's coming from the graph. Uh, the predicted is 16.3 plus 0 0.0908 times the 170. All right, so again, let's put that in the calculator. 16.3 plus 0 0.0908 times the 160, whoops, not 116, 170. All right, 31.74 about. So 31.74. So again, our residual is going to be actual minus predicted, or in this case, 35 minus 31.74, or in this case, 3.26. All right, so what are we doing here? We're, we're finding how far off each prediction was um, from the actual value. Now, why do we want to do this? All right. Now, we're going to get into this a little more next class, but basically, we need a way to evaluate whether or not our equation is any good. All right. Because we can always produce an equation, um, but we need a way to measure if it's done a good job? Is it a useful equation? Is it something that we want to use to make real world decisions? And residuals are kind of our way to start analyzing and saying like, all right, like how far off is this um, equation? Like what's going on here? Is this something worth using? Now, one of the ways we do this is we make what's called a residual plot, all right, which is where we take all of the residuals from our data set um, and plot them on a single graph. So the way these usually work is your X value here is gonna be your actual like body weights. All right, and the Y is gonna be your residuals. And you're always gonna put zero right here at the center. So again, zero would mean that your prediction was perfectly accurate. Um, and then you've got your residuals going up from there. So you've got your positive residuals up above and you've got your negative residuals down below. All right. And then the body weights, we can just be like, all right, there's 100, there's 120, 140, 160, 180, um, and so on and so forth. So the three residuals that we calculated were, what do we have? For a hiker that weighed 187, they ended up with a residual of negative four, so that might be like down here somewhere. For the hiker that weighed 116, they ended up with a residual of positive 1.17, so that might be up here somewhere. Um, and for the hiker that weighed 170, they had a residual of three point two six. All right. And we would continue to do this um, for all the points. And this is getting a little bit into next class.
but ideally you should see no pattern in the residuals. And again, we'll talk about that more next class, but you might as well write it down while we're here. All right. Now, why did I start talking about residuals? Why are we going through all this right now? Um, it's to give an exact definition of the least squares regression line, which again is the full name for the regression equations that you've been generating since ninth grade, right? So the least squares regression line is the line that makes the sum of the squared residuals as small as possible. All right, so what does this note down here say? All right, it says the sum of the residuals would be zero because the positive residuals and the negative residuals would cancel each other out. All right, we saw the same kind of problem when we were trying to calculate standard deviation. We square the residuals for the same reason we square the deviations when we calculate standard deviation. And this is sort of what we're trying to minimize. All right, we're minimizing the squared residuals um, in this equation. But basically, you're kind of balancing it out. So you're going to have sort of equal area below and equal area above when you work out um, these residuals. And what we're going to see is because we're squaring the residuals, you know, outliers can have a major impact on your regression equation. Again, because an outlier, once you square it, is even bigger. Um, so it's going to have an outsized impact um, on your equation. So we're going to see that you have to be very careful about detecting outliers and seeing what impact outliers have on your regression equation um, because they could lead you to make different real world decisions based on whether you include or exclude um, some of those outliers. All right. So here's the goal is to minimize sort of the the area of these squares um, and to find the line that goes through and does that. All right. So, you know, if the line was like this, we would see that the area would be a whole lot bigger. You know, if the line was down here, the area would be a whole lot bigger. It might not be intuitively obvious, but this is the line that is reducing that area of the squared residuals to as small as possible. So, how do we actually come up with that equation? Where does that actually come from? All right, so hand calculation of the equation for the least squares regression line. Now, we are going to do a couple of these just so that you can see where they come from. But most of the time, regression is done using calculators. It's done using computers um, because you're going to see in a second that it would be really tedious to try to do this by hand, All right, especially for any sort of large data set. So, given bivariant data, basically x and y, you start by calculating A few different things. One is the means of x and y. Two is the standard deviations of x and y. And three is the correlation between x and y. All right, so right off the bat, if you were doing it purely by hand, you'd have to calculate the mean by hand, which wouldn't be that bad, but it would still be annoying. You'd have to calculate the standard deviation by hand, which would be annoying, and you'd have to calculate the correlation by hand, which would be even more annoying. All right, so we can see that it's, it's not something 
that it lends itself well to um, hand calculations. All right, from there, the equation is y hat equals a plus bx. Again, remember in stats, b is your slope, a is your y-intercept. So again, not the same as it is in algebra, but just bear with me here. Um, where a equals y hat, sorry, y bar minus b times x bar. So again, let's just be clear about the symbols here. This is the average of y. This is the average of x. And this is the slope. So to calculate a, you need to already have b. So how do you get b? All right, b, all right, which again is our slope. A is our y-intercept. Just trying to make everything as clear as possible here. All right, is equal to r, which again is our correlation, times s of y over s of x. So that's the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. All right, now a couple of points here, All right? The point x bar, y bar, which again, we're talking average of x, average of y, must be on the regression line. Every single regression equation will go through the point x bar, y bar, right? The average of x and the average of y will be a point on the regression line, all right? And this is where the formula comes um, for finding A, all right? Really all we're doing is saying, all right, here's our starting equation. Y hat equals A plus BX, all right? If we know that it has to go through this point, we then say, all right, instead of y hat, we know that it's going through the point y bar. We know that it's going through the point x bar. So if we wanna solve for the y-intercept, which is a, we just subtract this from both sides and you get y bar, minus b times x bar equals a, which again is the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is just y bar minus b times x bar, all right? That's all that's happening there. Now, the slope, we can think of this as b equals r times s of y divided by s of x, all right? We can think of these two as being multiplied together. And this s of y over s of x is basically your change in y over change in x that we're used to seeing for slope, you know, rise over run, change of y, change of x. So what this is saying is that for a one standard deviation change, in x, y changes by some percentage of its own standard deviation according to R. So when R is really high, it's basically a one standard deviation change in X for a one standard deviation change in Y. When R is really low, which means there's a weak relationship, 
it's a one standard deviation change in X for barely any change in Y, because again, the relationship is really weak. And then when R flips to negative, right, that's what turns your slope negative, right? Instead of it being a positive change in Y, it becomes a negative change in Y because we're multiplying these two pieces together. All right, so that's kind of where these two different formulas are coming from and kind of how they all fit together. So let's actually take a look at an example here. All right, so here we have um, a study where it looked at how much, how many drinks somebody consumed and then the resulting BAC, so their blood alcohol content. So in this case, our explanatory variable would be the beers consumed and the response variable would be their BAC or blood alcohol content. All right, now X bar, Y bar, S of X, S of Y, R. All right, here's where it gets a little silly, right? Because we're gonna use our calculator to find all of these things. And to find R, we actually have to run the regression. So we're gonna know the answer before we even complete the calculations to see if we did it correctly. All right, so I admit it gets a little silly, but we're gonna do it anyways. All right, so give me a second. I'm gonna pause this so that I can put the data into the calculator. All right, so I've got all of the beers in the L1 column. I've got the BAC in the L2 column. So to get these starting values, I'm just going to go to stat, calc, and I'm going to run one variable stats on list one. All right, that'll give me my X bar. And we'll just write this as 4.667. It'll give me the S of X, which I'll write as 2.193. All right. Now I'm going to go and do the same thing for Y. So I'm going to go to back to stat calc. I'm going to run one variable stats. And then I'm going to run it on L2. Hit calculate again. All right. Now I've got an average of 0.073. I've got a standard deviation of 0.073. Oh, four, five. All right. Now, as I said, this is where it gets a little silly because to find the correlation, I'm going to go and run the regression and make sure that it's L1 and L2 there. All right. So my regression, I sorry, my correlation is 0.905. And then again, we're about to hand calculate what the calculator just gave us as the answer. So the calculator is telling us that Y hat equals 0.019 X uh, minus 0.015. All right. So we know that this is going to be our answer, and we're hoping that when we do the hand calculation, um, we get something similar. Now, before we do that, it is always a good idea to look at the scatter plot, all right? Because we did see in those notes a couple of classes ago that you could have some pretty weird shapes that still gave you a high correlation, but you shouldn't necessarily use linear regression. So it is a good idea to go and take a look at your stat plot or you look at your scatter plot. So again, my data is already in there. I have scatter plot selected. So I'm going to go to the graph. If you're not seeing the picture, you can go to zoom nine. All right. And we can see that in this case, the data is linear. All right. So if I wanted to sketch this quick, I could be like, all right, here is the beers. Here is the BAC. All right. And I can just do a quick sketch of this and say like, okay, we've got this one here. We've got these here. And then we've got one, two, three, four here. And then one here, one, two, three. Okay. Not exact, but a good enough approximation of what's happening here. And again, it's just always a good idea to be looking at the graph because these numbers by themselves 
can be misleading. So it's important to have this picture to make sure that you should be using a least squares regression line um, because it's possible that this would be curved or this would be exponential um, or it would have some really weird shape like we saw last time, um, which would make linear regression the wrong tool to analyze the data. All right. Now, let's take a look at the actual calculation and then we're gonna come back to this note on the side here. All right, so slope, if we're finding the slope of our regression line, and we always have to do this first, right? Because the second equation requires the slope. So we have to start with this equation, right? And this is saying R over SY SX. So we got our R and we know that that's 0 0.905 times S of Y, which was 0 0.045 over s of x, which is 2.193, all right? And then that's just kind of going over to your calculator and saying 0 0.905 times 0 0.045 divided by 2.193. And you end up with 0 0.01857, which again is gonna round to 0.0. 019, which is what we ended up with when we actually ran it on our calculator. So, so far, so good. Again, we might end up with slight differences just because we've been rounding the whole way. We rounded here, we rounded here, we rounded here. So we could end up with some tiny differences as we work through this. All right, once you've done the slope, then we can move on to the y-intercept. All right, and remember the y-intercept so if we're finding the y-intercept, it is y bar minus the slope times x bar, all right? And I'm just writing out slope here so that we don't get confused with like b's and m's and a's and all of that other stuff. So I'm just being very explicit here. Y-intercept is y bar minus the slope times x bar. So our y bar was 0.073. Our slope we found right here was 0 0.019. And our X bar, again, from up there was 4.667. All right, so at this point, we're just to calculator work, 0 0.073 minus 0 0.019 times the 4.667. And we end up with negative 0.016 if we're rounding, which is slightly different than what we got before. But again, with all the rounding that we did, that's not very surprising. Now, once we have these two numbers, we still have to stick them into the equation. So again, I'm just gonna note this was a rounding issue. Um, now, whether you write it as the stat version and say y hat equals a plus bx and then plug in for the different things, or whether you think of it as y equals mx plus b, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's still the same equation effectively. You know, your slope is getting plugged in right here your y-intercept is getting plugged in right here. So y hat equals negative 0 0.016 plus 0.019x. Or if you rewrite it the other way, so the slope comes first, 0.019x minus 0.016. Either way is fine. Um, I'm not going to take off if you write it this way or this, like this way versus this way or this way versus this way. It's fine. Um, just make sure that you actually remember to plug them back in. A lot of times kids do all the work and they find the slope and the y-intercept and then they don't actually write the equation, which is the final piece that you need to have there. All right. So this is, again, just kind of showing you where this is coming from on the calculator. 
right? It's not just something that's being pulled out of thin air. Um, it's based on, you know, different aspects of the variables, um, their correlations, their standard deviations, and their means. Now, last thing, and then we'll be done for the day. Um, the slope of a regression line for the standardized values. So this is just like something that you want to have in the back of your head. Now, standardized values refers to z-scores. And we know that if you turn an entire distribution into z-scores, the mean of that distribution is going to be zero. And the standard deviation of that distribution is going to be one. All right, so the slope of the regression um, for the standardized values is the correlation coefficient. Now, why would that be? Well, let's think about our formula. All right, the formula for slope is R times SY over SX. If you're turning the slope, if you're turning Y and X into Z scores, their standard deviations are going to become one. So the slope is going to be r times 1 over 1, or the slope is just going to become r. All right, so if you were doing a regression equation on z-scores, you automatically know that the slope is just going to be r because the standard deviations are both 1, and you've got this right here. Now, on the same token there, all right, if we think about our y-intercept, all right, our y-intercept formula, let me just block this off. All right, so our y-intercept formula we know is y bar minus slope times x bar. All right, well, we know that the average of both of these is zero, zero. All right, so it's just going to be y int is zero minus the slope times zero, or put another way, the y-intercept is always going to be zero. All right, so again, with this knowledge that z-score distributions always have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, we can sort of take that a step further and say, okay, so if we do a regression on those distributions, we know that the slope has to just be r, because the other parts are just going to be one, and we know that the y-intercept has to be zero because it's always going to go through the point x bar, y bar, which is, in the case of z-scores, zero, zero. All right, so just two things to know if you run a regression on z-scores, that the slope is going to work out to just be r, and the y-intercept is always going to have to be zero. All right, so that's it for today. Obviously, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out, and we will go from there. All right. Bye.